Appreciated that this morning. How many is glad that if it matters to you, it matters to God? Amen. We have a God who cares. If you got your Bibles, let's go to Psalm chapter 1 this morning. And Psalm chapter number 1, thank you for being here. And appreciate those that were here last night and came back again. Appreciate those who came for the first time this morning. And it's good to see some old friends and some new friends. Appreciate uh, those from Fort Worth and Dallas and Worth Baptist and Calvary. Uh, friends from Alvarado who've come. And just all over the place, ready to wake up. So thank you for coming and being part of this meeting. And trust you've been helped already. And we got an exciting day planned for you. we got free Chick-fil-A. Who's excited about that? Say amen. And i uh, got some inflatables for you. And I heard there was something like a 20-foot faith fall. Who says, I got faith for that? Raise your hand. How many says, I don't have faith for that? Raise your hand. Okay, I'm with you. And I'll be watching. I'll, I'll be a spectator on that. And so I appreciate you being here. And I trust that the Lord will speak to your heart. And we're going to have a lot of fun today. Uh, but the most important thing we'll do all day uh, is these sessions right here together as we open up the Word of God. And I love meetings like this. And it was a meeting just like this when I was 16 years old. It was a camp setting, but there were a bunch of teenagers there. And the Word of God was preached in one service on a Tuesday night. Uh, God got a hold of my life and changed the course of my life uh, ever since. So, and I love an opportunity like this. We get together, uh, a room full of people, and open up the Word of God. Because uh, just one message and one service could change your life forever. And that was the case for 12 young people last night who said yes to Jesus. Who's excited about that? And 12 young people came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. We rejoice with them and appreciate some of them being back with us again tonight, uh, this morning. And so today we just want to preach some simple Bible revival messages that will help you. And I told Pastor last night, the, the speaking of the crowd, I said, this is a mixed bag of tricks. And we had uh, young people who had probably never been in church before, and some of you have been in church all your life. And so I pray that wherever you're at spiritually in your relationship with God, uh, the messages will be applicable to you, and that you would take the next step in your spiritual, your Christian life. You say, Brother Taylor, who are you? And uh, I'm from Cleburne, Texas. There, uh, we got the church of Calvary, they're represented here tonight. And I was just a kid in the youth group, just like you, when I was 16 years old, that God, uh, 17 years old, when God called to preach. And I said, Lord, I'm not much. I don't have much. And, but I said, if you can use me, I'll be glad to be used. And it's been a wonderful journey. Amen. And so I want to encourage you that wherever you're at, whatever God wants you to do today, you just say yes to Jesus, whatever he says. If he says, I want you to change something in your life, say yes to Jesus. If he says, I want you to start doing something in your life, then say yes to Jesus. If God says, I want you to be saved today, then say yes to Jesus. Do whatever he wants you to do. You'll never regret saying yes to Jesus. You'll never regret being saved. You'll never regret surrendering your life and getting right with the Lord Jesus Christ. I've known many people who regretted not getting saved. I've known many people who regretted not giving their lives to Jesus. But you'll never regret following the Lord Jesus Christ. So wherever you're at today, whether you got saved last night, whether you've been saved for many, many years, I say yes to Jesus today. So let's jump into Psalm chapter 1 this morning and start off with just a good introductory message that I believe will be a help to everyone this morning. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 1, verse number 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Father, I pray that you would help us here for the next few moments as we open up your word. And Lord, I thank you again for every young person that's come today. And Lord, many of them could have slept in this morning and done something else, but they decided to get on a van and a bus and come all the way to the youth conference. And I believe they came for more than just the games and the free food. I believe they're here because uh, they have a desire to hear what you have to say to them this morning. And so Lord, whatever you say to us, I pray that we would obey. I do pray for the ones here this morning who are not saved and they do not know you as Savior. I pray when the invitation is given once again today that they'll not stay in their seats, but they'll respond and they'll come to know you as their Savior. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The story is told of a father of a vacationing family who came across a large sign that read, Road closed, do not...
not enter. The man proceeded around the sign because he was confident it would save them time. His wife was resistant to the adventure, but there was no turning back for this persistent road warrior. After a few miles of successful navigation, he began to boast about his gift of discernment, but his proud smile was quickly replaced with a humble sweat when the road led to a washed out bridge. He turned the car around, he retraced his tracks to the main road, and when they arrived at the original warning sign, he was greeted by large letters on the back of that sign which said, Welcome back, stupid. And uh, how many, how many's lived long enough to know uh, that life generally works better when you follow the instructions? Have you found that to be true? I'm going to say that's not just generally true about life. That's absolutely true when it comes to the Christian life. And when you and I come to Psalm chapter 1 this morning, here's what we learn. When it comes to living life, the Bible way is the best way. Uh, so when it comes to living life, the Bible way is the best way. In fact, notice the very first word, the word blessed there. In the Hebrew, it literally means, oh, how happy. And it's almost like God is holding up a giant sign that says, hey, young people, hey, teenager, you want to be happy? You want to have joy? You want to live a life of purpose that's going to matter for all of eternity? Then walk this way to exactly what I'm about to tell you to do. In fact, the old evangelist Billy Sunday, he put it this way. He said, if there's no joy in your Christian life, he said, there is a leak somewhere. And for some of us, it's the things we've allowed to leak into our lives. Others of us, it's the things we've allowed to leak out of our lives. And I pray the Holy Spirit would place his finger on the leaks in our lives here uh, this morning. I want to say this morning, God wants to bless your life. How many believes that? God's not mad every Sunday. Amen. I mean, God loves you. He wants to bless you your life. But when you come to Psalm chapter 1, we find there's some conditions that your life uh, must meet. In other words, if God's going to bless your life, then your life has to be blessable. And here in verses 1 and 2, God lays out some conditions for the way that we live our life. And we've got to meet the conditions if God's going to bless us and if we're going to have joy in the Christian life. I don't know about you, but I meet too many Christians who seem to be enduring the journey instead of enjoying the journey. How many tonight says, I want to enjoy the journey of the the Christian life. I want to be blessed. I want to have joy. I want to be biblically and truly happy. This morning, God says you can if you live your life the Bible way. This morning, I'm going to preach on this subject, how to be a Psalm 1 Christian. How to be a Psalm 1 Christian, a Christian that truly has joy in their heart and their life. Notice number one, if your life is going to be blessed by God, if you're going to be a Psalm 1 Christian, number one, you must be separated from the world. You must be separated separated from the world. In fact, notice verse number one again. Blessed is the man that walketh not. Isn't it interesting that God, first of all, he starts off with the thing, he starts off with the negative, he starts off with the things that we ought not do. God, isn't it interesting? God says a man or a woman that is blessed by God, initially it's not about what you do, it's initially about what you do not do. Excuse me, it's about the things you don't watch on television. It's the things that you, the places that you don't go, and the friends that you don't run with. It's initially about what you don't do. And God says, if I'm going to bless your life, there's some things in this world you must separate yourself from. He says, first of all, you need to be separated from sinful counsel. He says, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel or the advice of the ungodly. The ungodly are those who are without God and those who disregard God. In other words, here's what he's saying this morning. He says, there's lots of voices out in that world out there. And you and I ought to be very careful about the voices that we listen to because if you listen to the wrong voices out there you're going to get your life off track as a Christian. There's a story in the Old Testament. God comes to Saul and says, Saul, I want you to kill all the Amalekites and all the sheep and all the oxen. Well, he goes off and kills most of the Amalekites and most of the sheep and most of the oxen. By the way, in 2019, partial obedience is still disobedience. Well, Samuel, the preacher, comes to check on him and says, Saul, did you do everything that God told you to do? He says, yes, sir, got the job done. Then Samuel says, then why do I still hear sheep and why do I still hear oxen? All of a sudden, he begins to backpedal. He starts to blame shift. He said, well, the people disobeyed. But the Bible says that Saul and the people disobeyed. Finally, his back is pinned up against the wall. He makes a confession and he says, I have sinned for I feared the people and I obeyed 
their voice. Hey, you better be careful about the voices that you listen to. You say, what are you talking about this morning? I'm talking about being careful about allowing the wrong influences into your life. Remember the story a lot in the Old Testament? If all we had was his life in the Old Testament, we would say, based on the life that he lived, that man is in hell today. I mean, you read the, the end of his life, and he's drunk committing incest with his own daughters in a cave. Makes me want to vomit, just to be honest with you. But you come to the New Testament, and we find out that was a saved man. The Bible says of this just lot. It speaks of his righteous soul. You say, how does a saved man, a Christian man, end up destroying his life like that? The, the New Testament, Second Peter said, it was through media. You say, preacher, I mean, I just got saved last night. I'm new to the church, and I'm new to my youth group, and I don't know a whole lot about the Bible. But Brother Taylor, in the, in the Bible, they, they didn't have Red Box, and they didn't have Netflix, and they didn't have iPhones back then. What do you mean through media? The Bible says that he vexed his righteous soul through the things that he saw and the things that he heard. Hey, you better be careful about the things you watch on television. You better be careful of the shows you watch on Netflix. You better be careful about the YouTube videos that you watch and the music that you listen to. God says you better not allow the wrong influences into your life. In fact, Proverbs puts it this way. Solomon writes to his son and he says, Rehoboam, I keep thy heart with all diligence. I keep thy heart with all diligence. That word keep means to guard. It means to protect. In the Bible, they had wells and they had to keep the wells covered. If you didn't keep the wells covered, then the enemy could come along and throw a dead animal into the well and it would pollute the drinking water. And so with that picture and that imagery in mind, he says, my son, you better keep your heart covered. You better protect your heart. You better uh, guard your heart unless the enemy comes along and puts something into your heart that's going to end up polluting your life. You say, how do the wrong things end up in our life and into our heart? They come through the things that we watch and the things that we listen to. God says, you want me to bless your life? Then you better get the wrong influences out of your life. The fact of the matter is, there's some saved young people. I'm talking about children of God tonight, this morning, that are here. The things that you are listening to on your iPod and on your phone and on your playlist, they're not helping you, they're hurting you. The things you watch on television, a child of God ought not be watching. And tonight, the reason some of you are struggling uh, spiritually is because you allow the wrong influences and the wrong sinful worldly things into your life. God says, you want me to bless your life? You want to have joy? You want to be biblically happy? Then get the wrong influences in the world out of your life. Notice number two, he also says this, not only be separated from sinful counsel, he says be separated from sinful companions. Be separated from sinful companions. He says, nor standeth in the way of sinners. I love the Bible. And if there's one word to describe the Bible, it's my favorite, it's the word relevant. Isn't that a buzzword today? Everybody wants to know what's relevant. Many times we speak at teen camps and, and youth conferences and teen uh, revivals and, and rallies like this. And many times young people, just like you, some of you, you look Look at the Word of God, and your attitude towards the Bible is something like this. This old school book is something like Shakespeare that has no relevance for my life today. But I want to say this morning, there's no other book in the world that has any more relevance to your life than the Word of God. Friend, there's nothing more relevant than the Word of God. In fact, it's more up to date than this morning's newspaper, and it has a lot to say about the friendships and relationships that you have in 2019. May I remind you this morning that the Bible says, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. My, the Bible says, my son, uh, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. In other words, you show me your friends and I'll show you your future because your friends will determine your future. You want to know who you're going to end up like? Show me the people you spend time with. God says, you want me to bless your life? You better get the wrong influences out of your life, and you better get the wrong individuals out of your life. The fact of the matter is, the reason some of you are struggling spiritually in your life, the reason some of you are struggling in your relationship with God, is because you're running with the wrong crowd, you're running with the wrong friends, and they're not helping you, they are hurting you. They're not bringing you closer to Christ, they're bringing you further away from Christ. And for some of you, you need to unfriend the wrong friends out of your life. You say, how do you do that? Do you got to be mean about it? you got to be a jerk about it? Not at all. You just get on fire for Jesus Christ this morning and say, I love God with all my heart and I'm going to live for him. And I promise you, those around you that don't want to live that way, they'll separate themselves from you. 
You, but there's always one, the crowd preacher. Well, uh, uh, Jesus ate with the publicans and sinners. I understand that, but here's the difference. They weren't influencing him. He was influencing them. And when you get to the place in your life and your friends are pulling you down instead of bringing you closer to God, at that point you need to separate from yourself and you need to kick some folks to the curb. Get the wrong friends and the wrong crowd out of your life. Let me go on to say this. Is it okay to preach on a Saturday morning at youth conference? You don't attract what you want, you attract what you are. I said you don't attract what you want, you attract what you are. And if you're surrounded by people that do not love God, they don't give a rip about this book, they could care less about church, you need to stop looking around you and start looking within you and ask yourself, why are these people attracted to me? It may be because you're like them. You don't attract what you want, you attract what you are. God says, you want me to bless your life? You better get the wrong influences out of your life, and you better get the wrong individuals out of your life. Notice he goes on to say, the last phrase in verse 1, nor sitteth in the sea of the scornful. Nor sitteth in the sea of the scornful. You know what a scorner is? Usually every youth group has one. They're the kids that scorn and criticize and complain about everything. Well, I don't like this, and I don't like that. And they're always complaining. They always got a bad attitude. In fact, if that's you right now, then your face is appearing in everybody else's mind in your youth group. Everybody okay this morning? This is not the Jerry Seinfeld Comedy Hour. This is a youth conference Bible preaching. Scorner. They scorn everything. Do you realize according to, and the Bible, the Bible says that he sit in the seat of the scornful. You know what that indicates? That he was comfortable there. He could scorn and it didn't bother him. Now according to verse number one, you, you may not pick it up. There's not a progression, it's a digression. Do you realize according to verse number one, you can go from being on fire for God all the way over here to making fun of those that are on fire for God. How many know somebody in your youth group at one time, boy, they were there Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, man, they were on fire for God, then something happened, and slowly they started getting away from the church, and now their whole attitude has changed, and they're far from God, and they've become a scorner. How many know somebody like that? Can I say that? If it happened to them, it could happen to you. And if it happened to them, it could happen to me. You say, how does this happen? Real easy. You start listening to the wrong crowd. And you'll begin lingering with the wrong crowd. And if you linger long enough with the wrong crowd, eventually you'll be like the wrong crowd. In other words, sin always brings you down. Do you see the direction of this text this morning? Sin will always lower you. It'll always bring you down. And for some of you, over the past several weeks and months and the past couple of years, your Christian life has been nothing but a downward spiral. Sin will always take you in a downward direction. He says, number one, if I'm going to bless your life, if you're going to have joy in this, in this world, then you've got to keep yourself separated from the world. Now listen to me. I'm not talking about isolation this morning. There's a difference between isolation and separation. God did not call you, save you, and call you to hide in some underground bunker until Jesus comes. Do you hear me this morning? There's a difference between separation and isolation. In fact, Warren Wearsby just died yesterday. He said it this way. He said, separation is not isolation. He said, it's contact without contamination. In other words, there's something wrong with the boat being in the water. The problem comes when the water gets in the boat. You and I live in the world. We can't help that. And there's something wrong with you and I living in the world. The problem comes when the world starts getting into us. And for some of you as Christians, the world has been getting into you. And it has an influence over you. It's affecting your heart. It's affecting your, uh, your Christian life. And today, some of you need to separate yourselves from the world and sin. God says that is the first step. But I want you to notice here this morning, this thing is part one and part two. There's part A and there's part B. You say, Brother Tate, do you know who you're preaching to this morning? I mean, we got on a bus and drove three hours. To, I mean, of all the things we could have done on a Saturday morning, we got on a bus early this morning. I mean, like at six, I didn't even know six o'clock existed on a Saturday morning. I've never seen it before, but I got on a bus and I come all this way to hear Bible preaching today. Preacher, you know who I'm talking, you know you who you're preaching to. Listen to me. I know for many of you here this morning, I mean, you're faithful and you love God. And for most of you, I could have skipped verse number one this morning because spiritually, many of you, you have your spiritual eyes dotted and your T's crossed. And you say, Brother Taylor, I mean, I'm church, I'm church on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night. I try to listen to the right kind of music and I try to have the right kind of friends. I got all that down, Brother Taylor. But listen to me. I know a whole lot of Christian teenagers. They got verse number one down, but they don't have verse number two down. 
And if all you have is verse number one down, but you don't have verse number two down, it's only a matter of time before you spiritually dry rot from the inside out. You say, well, what's verse number two? Number one, God says, if you're going to be a Psalm 1 Christian, you must be separated from the world. But number two, you must be saturated with the Word. You must be saturated with the Word. Notice the verse, verse number two. The Bible says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. I love that. But his delight. In other words, he does not delight in the things that are found in verse number one. He delights in the things that are found in verse number two. You say, what's found in verse number two? The wonderful Word of God. Of God. Can I say this morning? Hey, there's no book like this book. There's thousands of libraries that contain millions of books, but there's no book like the wonderful Word of God. And can I say this? God only wrote one book. It wasn't the Book of Mormon. It wasn't the Book of Koran. God only wrote one book, and that is the Bible. How many is thankful for your Bible this morning? God says if you're going to be a Psalm 1 Christian, first of all, you've got to fall in love with the Bible. It says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. Let me ask you this morning, uh, what do you enjoy? What do you delight in? Not a trick question, not a setup, doesn't have to be spiritual. How many today says, I enjoy sports? Would you raise your hand? How many's been watching the stars on television there? They've been whooping up on them. How many enjoy, how many of you ladies enjoy shopping? Would you raise your hand? You enjoy shopping? Stay away from my wife. Thank you very much. And uh, how many, how many enjoy eating? Would you raise your hand? Amen. I can tell. No, just kidding. And uh, my wife, just kidding. My wife, she's addicted to chocolate. Anybody else? Else like chocolate and then yeah this young lady does she got a box of it and uh, we were several years ago we were traveling through Hershey Pennsylvania you know what's in Hershey Pennsylvania the Hershey factory and so we were driving down the interstate and my wife started seeing signs on the billboards advertising this place and she just believed it was the divine will of God for her to go and visit I mean it was the will of God for her she just had a piece about it and so she said she started begging me won't you take me won't you I said fine I'll take you and finally we got to the Hershey factory and folks we pulled into the parking lot and my wife started licking the window no just kidding she didn't do that uh, but she was uh, she's not here this morning uh, but she uh, she 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 loves chocolate you say brother Taylor what did you what do you delight in I enjoy hunting and fishing amen anybody else like that and uh, listen here in Texas listen if it's brown it's down if it flies it dies amen and uh, I love it we live in our we, I live in a travel trailer as an evangelist but if you were to go to my mom and dad's house there in Cleveland and walk to the front doors it feels like you're walking into a taxidermy shop. I mean, there's whitetails and hogs and rams and turkeys and ducks. I mean, we love to kill animals. It's a wonderful thing. Amen. What? To, just kidding. What do you delight in? Now, listen to me. Here's the point I'm trying to make. There's nothing wrong with sports. You all enjoy sports. There's nothing wrong with uh, shopping. You all enjoy shopping. You may enjoy video games. Whatever you enjoy, you ought to enjoy those things. But listen to me, please. Just as much as you delight in those things, you ought also to delight in the Word of God. And I'm asking you as your friend this morning, do you love the Bible? So a number of years ago, there's a book written by Robert uh, Sumner. He was a preacher. He's dead now. But it's called The Wonderful Works of God. And in that book, he wrote about a young man who lived in Kansas City who was at work one day and involved in an explosion. This explosion, because he was severely burned uh, all over his body, lost his fingers and hands, lost his eyesight. As he is laid in the, up in the burn unit of the ICU of Kansas City, someone came to him one day and said, Sir, what's the worst part of this entire experience? He was a new Christian. This is what he said. He said, The worst part is that I'm no longer able to read the Word of God. Not long after that, they learned about a lady who lived in England who could read Braille, what blind people read, with her lips. He thought, I can do that too. They sent off for a Bible in Braille. It finally got to where he was eventually. And, and boy, they got there and they unwrapped that Bible. And they, uh, his heart was racing. He was excited. And they brought that Bible up to his face. But unfortunately, the nerve endings on his lips had been burned off. And he could not feel the pages. His heart sank, as you can imagine. He was disappointed. But as they took the Bible away from his face that day, his tongue slid across some of the raised characters on the page, and he felt it, and he thought to himself, I can read the Bible with my tongue. By the time that man, by the time Robert Sumner's book came out, that man had read the Bible four times with his tongue. I'm asking you this morning, do you really love the Word of God? 
have a pastor friend in Tucson, Arizona. His name's Brent Armstrong. He goes on missions trips all over the world uh, several times a year. A number of years ago, he was in China preaching in some of the underground churches. It was a Sunday morning, and a handful of ladies had walked to the service that morning. It was a barn-type structure they were meeting in, and a handful of ladies had come to church that morning. One of the ladies was a little bit different. She was kind of dressed kind of funny, and I didn't really have many teeth in her head, but uh, she came that morning, and, and Pastor Armstrong was going to preach about the Word of God. Before he began the message that morning, he asked if anybody could stand up and quote a verse of Scripture they had committed to memory. Well, that lady, that was a little bit different, she stood up, and she began to quote from Matthew chapter 1, this book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of David, and on down she went and quoted the entire first chapter of Matthew. When she got done, the lady beside her tugged on her and said, sit down. Pastor Armstrong went on to preach the message that morning. He finished out the service, and afterwards he went to the lady who told the other lady to sit down and said, Ma'am, why did you have her sit down? She looked up at him and said, Preacher, if I had not stopped her from quoting Matthew chapter 1, she would have went on to quote the entire book of Matthew. Later on found out that was the only book of the Bible she had translated in her language. I'm asking you this morning, do you really love the Word of God? If there's one thing we need here this morning, at the basic training youth conference, right here the, uh, the teenagers, and the church is represented here in Central Texas, we ought to have a Bible revival and there will be some young people that fall in love with the Word of God again who would say like David, oh how I love thy law. Who would say with Job, I esteem the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Who would say like a first, a first Peter chapter 2, as a newborn babe, desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. Can I say this? That, that verse, that last verse I just quoted, that took on a whole new meaning after I had a child. Well, I didn't have a child. My wife had a child. But uh, nonetheless, and uh, when you have a newborn baby, you don't have to set those kids on a timer to know when it's time to feed them. Them kids are going to let you know when it's time to feed them. And so, man, they, they start crying their heads off. And so you get that milk. And, man, you start bringing it up to their face. And, man, they'll start lunging at that bottle trying to get a hold of it. They want it so bad. But if time had gone on, it was time for them to feed about the general time. And time was going on. And you tried to feed them. They just weren't hungry. And that went on for a while. Eventually, you would know something was wrong with that baby. You say, why? Because a healthy baby is a hungry baby. And listen to me, a healthy Christian is a hungry Christian. And if you don't have a hunger and a craving for the Word of God, listen to me, there's something wrong with you. There's something wrong with you. You say, what's wrong with me? Listen to me, sin. Second, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, it says, As a newborn babe, desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. But the verse right before that, verse number 1 says, Laying aside all anger and malice and envy... In other words, God says, get the sin out of your life and you'll begin to crave the Word of God. Well, it's almost like there's a pattern throughout Scripture, isn't there? Do you love the book? Well, some of you teenagers right here, right now, you can go back to a time in your life when you woke up every morning before school and you would make sure you made the Word of God a priority in your life and you read it every day. And listen to me, consequently, you are closer to God during that time in your life than you have ever been. But some of you, you no longer read the Bible. You don't look forward to coming to church anymore. You don't memorize the Bible. You don't study the Bible. God says, you want me to bless your life? You want to be a Psalm 1 Christian? Then you've got to fall in love with the Bible all over again. Not only does he delight in the Word of God, but notice the second half of the verse. He also dwells in the Word of God, and the Word dwells in him. It goes on to say, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Look, and it's not enough to just read the Bible. Now, if you don't read the Bible, then today, I'm not beating you up. I'm putting my arm around you and as your friend and say, when you leave here, go home and begin every day to read the Word of God. But some of you, let's be honest with you, you read the Bible every morning, but come lunchtime, you can't remember one thing that you read. Now, listen, we all do that from time to time. Be honest. We all do that from time to time. But if you do that day in and day out, let's be honest, that's not helping anybody. God says, I want you to take the next step in your Christian life. And the next step for you is not just reading the Bible, but it's meditating on the Bible. In his law doth he meditate day and night. You say, that sounds kind of weird. What's meditation? One little boy put it this way. He said, it's when your mouth shuts, but your head keeps on talking. Anybody here had a bad day at school? 
Those are the homeschoolers, amen. And you just had a bad day at school and, and uh, maybe you got beat up or whatever. And mom and dad come and, and pick you up from school. And all the way home, you're kind of looking out of the passenger side, the, the window. And finally, mom and dad look across the car and they say, w what are you thinking about? You say, how'd they know I was thinking about something? You had the look on your face. What were you doing at that moment? You were mulling over, you were dwelling on, you were thinking about, you were meditating on that bad situation that took place at school or earlier that day. Now listen, that's a bad form of meditation, but that is meditation. Y'all got cows around here? I mean, my soul, it's Texas, ain't it? Uh, cows will wake up, and I know some of you just had breakfast, so excuse this illustration, but cows will wake up in the morning, and, and they'll get their stomachs, plural, stomachs filled with grass. In the afternoon, the sun will come up, and they'll find a shade tree, and they'll begin to regurgitate that grass into their mouth, and they'll start chewing that regurgitated grass. We call that chewing the cud, don't we? And they start chewing that cud, and they break it down, and they swallow it, and they digest it. It becomes a part of their body. That is a beautiful, well, that's not a beautiful picture, but that is a picture, that is a picture of meditation. God says, I don't want you to just read the Word of God, but I want you to regurgitate what you read, and I want you to take that truth, that text, that passage of Scripture, that story, and I want you to meditate, and I want you to think about it over and over and over again until that truth becomes a part of your life. Can you see how at that point the Bible starts to get into us, and once it gets into us, it starts to change us? Let me ask you a question. When's the last time you changed something in your life because the Bible told you to? I mean, really, how's your relationship with the book? D.L. Moody said, this book will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from this book. Charles Spurgeon said, a Bible that's falling apart usually belongs to a life that isn't. Howard Hendricks, the old Bible teacher, he said, dusty Bibles lead to dirty lives. Well, today, we need some young people that would have a Bible revival and fall in love with the Word of God once again. Number one, if you want God to bless your life, if you're going to have joy, if you're going to not just endure the journey, but enjoy the journey, God says you must be separated from the world and you must be saturated with the Word of God. Now here's why some of you are frustrated this morning in your Christian life. You have the whole thing backwards. We're in the home stretch now, so stay with me. Some of you have the whole thing backwards. And instead of being separated from the world and saturated with the Word, many of you this morning are separated from the Word and saturated with the world and you wonder why you have no joy in your Christian life. Some of you need to make a reversal, and that reversal would bring revival to your life. Get the world out of your life and get the Word of God back into your life. And when you do those two things, look what happens in verse number three, and we'll be done. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Get that picture in your mind, would you? In fact, just close your eyes and picture that. He shall be like a tree planted next to a river of water. Can you imagine that? Listen, this is not a dying tree. This is not a decaying tree. This is a thriving tree. It is flourished and it's nourished. And it goes on to say uh, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither. In other words, when the storms blow in, hey, its leaf also shall not wither. And it goes on to say, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. You say, why is that tree flourishing? Why is it thriving? Why is it growing? Why is it so fruitful? Because it's planted next to the river of water. The river of water there is a picture of the word of God. And that tree ought to be a picture of your life. Look, the most important part of a tree is not the parts you see. It's not the trunk. It's not the branches. It's not the leaves. It's the part that you don't see. It's the root structure. And the Bible says that this is planted next to the river of water, and the roots are connected to that water source, and it's drawing strength and life and nourishment from the water. Can I say the most important part of your life is not the part everybody sees. It's the part only God sees. And every day you ought to put your roots into the water of God's Word and draw out nourishment for your day-to-day -day life. Several summers ago we were invited to preach a back-to-school retreat in this, right here in Texas, just north of San Antonio at the Colorado Bend State Park in the month of August. If you didn't hear anything I just said, I said Texas and August, it was brutal. And so we slept in tents that week and it was, it was the worst week of my life. And, uh, it was, uh, and so that we slept in tents and the first activity of the week was a three mile hike. And it was a mile and a half in and it was a mile and a half out, three miles round trip. And the whole inside 
sense of for that, uh, for, for that hike was a mile and a half in. There was going to be a river and a waterfall. We could jump in and do all that. And so we started, I'm talking about, it was, it was, in, it was August in Texas. It was triple digits. It was ridiculous. And so we started on this death march, and that's what it was. And so we started, and again, you know how it is in Texas in August. There was no green grass anywhere. Everything was dead and dried up. There was no leaves on the trees. In fact, the, 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 the trees and the limbs were so dead and brittle, you would brush up against them with your shoulder, and the branches would break off and fall to the ground. Everything was dead. Nothing was green. Nothing was living. And so we started off, and that's how everything was. But the closer we got to that river, things started changing. All of a sudden, grass started to appear on the ground. All of a sudden, the trees had leaves on them. Well, finally, we got down there to that river, and sure enough, the water was flowing. There was moss all over the rocks. Other than the waterfall was going. Everything was green. Everything was cool. Everything was shaded. Here's what I'm saying. There was a night and day difference between the trees that were planted next to the river of water and that was not planted next to the river of water. And friend, there's a night and day difference between a Christian that's planted next to, uh, that, that spends time in the Word of God and that does not spend time in the Word of God. Your life is a picture of one of those two trees. And what you depend, what you do with the Bible will depend what God does with you. Can I give you one more illustration? I just feel like the Lord's leading me to say this from this morning. I was 16 years old. I was away from the Lord. I had hair down to here. I was, uh, didn't have a good relationship with my mom and dad. I was barely going to church. I did everything I could to not go to church. And when you're not right with God, you don't want to go to church. When you're not right with God, you don't want to read your Bible. When you're not right with God, you, you don't want to be around your pastor and youth pastor. When you're not right with God, you pull away. And so that's what I was when I was 16 years old. I was pulling away from church. And, and uh, about that time, God sent a youth pastor to our church by the name of Brother Earl Sides. And he came to our church and he invited me to go to camp with him. And I said, sure, I'll go to camp. And that week at camp, God got a hold of my life. And uh, I, like the prodigal son, came back home and got right with the Lord. And, and God changed my life that week. But that same week, there was a young man who also came with us to camp. And his name was Jordan. And Jordan didn't live in Cleburne. He lived in Keene, one city over. And uh, Jordan started coming. And uh, he, he came with us to camp that week. And he had gone to a church that taught that you have to be good enough to get to heaven. You have to work your way to heaven. But, but the Bible teaches that you don't behave your way into heaven you believe your way into heaven the bible says believe on the lord jesus christ and thou shalt be saved and so jordan came he heard the gospel at camp that week and jordan got saved when i say he got saved he got all of it amen i mean god got a hold of him and I remember that week, really, our youth group, uh, Calvary Baptist, we had revival in our youth group. The last night of camp, we had a testimony service. And if you've ever been to camp, you know how your church gets together on the last day of camp. And you start giving testimonies. And uh, so we did that one uh, that Friday night. And uh, everybody was skidding up. And, man, girls were crying. Mascara was running. I mean, it was a good one. And the people said, i got to get this out of my life. And i got to get this right. I mean, youth workers, adult youth workers were standing up, getting right publicly with one another, getting right. I mean, there was revival in the youth group. Finally, Brother Earl stood up and he said, all right, we're going to go home. And on Sunday night, we're going to have a testimony service. I want you to tell about what God did in your heart. And he said, at the end of that service, at the invitation, he says, I'm going to preach. And at the invitation, we're going to bring a trash can out and we're going to set it in front of the church. And he said, everything God told you to get out of your life, I want you to bring it and put it in the trash can that night. Well, Sunday night rolled around. We had a testimony service. We gave testimonies. A brother old preach. They gave the invitation. And sure enough, here comes the trash can. And all of a sudden, the invitation started. News that began. We prayed. We, everybody stood up. And all of a sudden, here comes Jordan with his hands full of all kinds of music and video games and magazines. And he walked down and he put all those sinful things in the trash. And he separated them himself from those sinful worldly things. Well, Jordan began to grow. I mean, he was there Sunday, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. He was there for a missions conference. He was there for revival meetings and youth activities, men's meetings, women's meetings. It didn't matter. Jordan was always at church. I remember he began to get so serious about the Word of God in his life that, that he, he, it became such a priority. It just clicked with him as a young Christian that he had to have the Word of God. It became so serious about reading the Bible that he put a rule on his own life, and that rule was this, no breakfast, no Bible. No breakfast, no Bible. And he would not allow himself to read the Bible until, uh, excuse me, no Bible, no breakfast. He would not allow himself to eat breakfast in the morning until first he had spent time in the Word 
of God. That's how serious he was. He started to grow. I remember him getting a burden for his own family members. I remember as he led his, his stepmom to Christ. I, I watched as he led his dad to Christ. I watched as he led his sister to Christ. And one by one on a Sunday night in our church, the Calvary Baptist, they had walked down the aisle and they get baptized in our church. He won his family to Christ. But the one person he could not seem to win to Christ was his brother. And I remember him begging and pleading and weeping tears over his brother and praying that his brother would get saved, but his brother just refused to get saved. During those years, we would have uh, youth rallies much like this in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, and that particular uh, Saturday was going to be held at our church in that month. And so uh, we were going to bring in Evangelist Brian Sams that week. And so he came in, and and, and, uh, Jordan went to his brother and said, man, we're going to have a a youth rally on a Saturday. There's going to be games and free pizza. It's going to be a special teen service won't you come and finally his brother said fine i'll come one time he came that saturday and brother sam's preached the gospel gave the invitation and sure enough jordan's brother got up out of his seat he walked down an aisle and he came to get saved afterwards we were over in the gym and we were having pizza and and, and uh, fellowshipping and uh, i was sitting next to brother sam's and all of a sudden jordan's brother walked to the side door he walked in, and Brother Sam said, hey, let's go rejoice with him. He walked over to his brother and said, hey, I, hey, did you get saved today? He says, yes, sir, Brother Sam's, I did get saved today. He says, you want to know why I got saved today? And he took his finger, and he pointed back behind us, and he said, he's the reason why I got saved today. And we turned around, and there was standing Jordan. Listen to me. If I ever saw a Psalm 1 Christian with my own eyes, it was Jordan. The Bible says that it's a mirror. So when you look into the mirror of God's word this morning, I want to know, is your life a reflection of Psalm chapter 1? Are you a Psalm 1 Christian? Father, we love you today. And Lord, you've made your word crystal clear. Lord, we've got to get the world out of our life. And we've got to keep the word in our life. If you're here this morning and say, Preacher, at some point in that message, God spoke to me. There's some things in my life right now that they are not helping me spiritually. They are hurting me spiritually. And tonight, God, show me some influence, some sin, some individual that I need to get out of my life. I need to separate myself from. If that's you this morning, would you raise your hand? God, talk to, God spoke to my heart this morning. He convicted me. There's something in my life that's there that I need to get out. Yes, praise the Lord for you. That's what this weekend is all about. If you're here today and say, it's preacher, at one time I read the Bible every day. At one time I couldn't wait to get to Sunday school. I couldn't wait to come to church. I was in love with the Word of God. But as time has gone on, one something or this or that, I've gotten away from the Word, and I do not love the Bible like I used to. God spoke to me this morning. God convicted me. Brother Taylor, I need to have a Bible revival. I need to fall in love with the Bible once again. If that's you, would you lift your hand up this morning? That's me, Brother Taylor. I need to fall in love with the Bible once again. Every day I'm in the Word. Every day I'm in the Word. Praise the Lord for you. Let me say this. The greatest thing the Bible tells us is how to be saved. Paul wrote to Timothy. He said, And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation, which is through faith in Christ Jesus. The Bible teaches that you're a sinner. The Bible says because of your sin, you're on your way to hell. The Bible says for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Bible says God loves you. The Bible says that Jesus died for you and was buried for you and rose again for you. And if you would put your faith in Jesus, you could be saved and have your sins forgiven and go to heaven one day. That's what the Bible says. You say, preacher, I'm not sure that I'm going to heaven. I don't know that I'm saved. I came last night and I heard the message and God's been working in my heart. I'm not sure that I'm saved. I'm not sure I'm going to heaven Preacher, pray for me. I'm concerned about my soul this morning. If that's you, would you raise your hand this morning? Preacher, pray for me. Pray for me. I see this hand in the back. Anybody else? Preacher, pray for me. Preacher, pray for me. I don't know that I'm going to heaven. Pray for me. Let's go ahead and have an invitation. Father, please bless this time of of an invitation. And Lord, you spoke to our hearts today. Lord, help us to come and speak to you and make those things right. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go ahead and stand to our feet. And as the music begins to play, every head bowed, every eye closed. If God spoke to your heart this morning, I want to invite you to come and use these altars. I know it's just the first session, but we only got two. We want to make the most of these two sessions that we have together today. If God spoke to your heart, you say yes to Jesus. Today, God said, hey, you you need to get that out of your life. 
Hey, that music you've been listening to, it's not helping you. It's hurting you. Those shows that you watch, it's not helping you as a Christian. It's hurting you. Those friends that you've been spending time with, they're hurting you. Christian, can you say like David, oh, how I love thy law. J.C. Ryle said, the more I read the Bible, the more I desire to read the Bible. And the less I read the Bible, the less I desire to read the Bible. Some of you today just need to get honest and say, God, I don't even desire to read the Word. But God, I want to. God, would you give me the desire to read the Bible? Lord, you know that I try and it seems like I'm good for a few days and then I fall off again. Lord, would you help me just be faithful one day at a time? One day at a time, read your word. If you're here and need to be saved, I'm going to invite you to simply slip out of your seat. And if you'd walk straight to the back, we have men and women with Bibles that would love to show you from the word of God how to be saved. You won't miss out on anything. This is the most important thing in this moment. If you're here and need to be saved, simply step out of your seat. Walk right to the back. Men and women are waiting for you. They'll answer your questions. They'll lead you to Jesus from the Bible. Altars are open, won't you come?